Ciao. <laughs> All right, we're back for another live transmission in this uh, never-ending day of wisdom, and uh, I'm joined by Anthony Mativier. Um, Anthony, how are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me on the on the event. Well, it's a pleasure. It's uh, the first time, so we're happy you could make it. Yeah. It's... So, for those who don't know you, um, can you give us a little introduction to yourself and Maybe uh, I have a question you can maybe use to form your answer. Did you get into languages first or, m or memory techniques first? Well, I suppose languages first. I was born into language having bilingual a bilingual father, so there was always that. And then I became very, very interested in language at a, at a young age because I was so interested in literature and reading. And then when I got to university, of course, in Canada, you have lessons by virtue of birth in, in French, in, in English Canada in any case, and so there's that sort of cultural heritage, and then in university to do a PhD you have to have, you know, working knowledge and ability in, a, in another language, so there was that, and yeah, and then I moved to Germany, and so if you really want the German experience, you got to get up to speed, and <laughs> so in all of that, though, I got into memory techniques, not for language, but for dealing with all my university field exams, and then it became very, very obvious to me that this applies to language learning. It's just how, and so I just started developing systems and techniques and approaches that uh, have gotten way more extraordinary results for myself and other people than I could have anticipated. So then the step is always to reverse engineer a little bit and see exactly what can be refined in all of this and right. uh, you see the limitations, you see the strengths and then you work on reducing the limitations and strengthening the strengths so it's been really exciting. Yeah, it's so fascinating. I, I think the way the memory works is, I mean, it's really interesting. I, I talked to um, Ed Cook from Memrise, you know, he's a bit of a memory geek, I think it's safe to say. <laughs> and yeah. just, uh, just asking him about just general memory techniques and he just goes everywhere. It's like, oh yeah, there's this and this and this and this and and that's sort of the feeling I get from you a little bit as well when I visit your website, uh, Magnetic Memory Method, right? Yeah, magneticmemorymethod.com. Um, to some of the podcasts, is it's just like, it's such a big topic. Like how do you make, how do you boil it down to something where people can actually get a lot out of it without having to study for five years? Well, I think that actually in within two hours you can pretty well be a master at it if you want to be, but uh, it is atomic. It's one of those little tiny grains of sand that when you hit it with the right hammer it explodes into everything and you begin to see that actually we are memory That's, and time is memory. It's a, Time is a phenomenon of memory so we really live in memory, and that's why someone like Ed Cook can go on about it for hours and hours and hours, and I can go on about it for hours and hours and hours, <laughs> because when you, when you start to think about it in a particular way, you realize that there is only memory. Right. And what are some of the big, uh, I wouldn't say problems, but if people don't know anything about advanced memory techniques at all, and they're in school, and they're desperately trying to test or uh, practice for a test or an exam or something... What are some of the worst things people can do or uh, not do, I guess, is the, is the counter as well? Well, the worst thing that you can do is get stressed out. And, I mean, that sounds really simple, but it's really, that is the ultimate worst thing you can do because the actual examination process, no matter what subject it is or no matter what memory techniques you're using or you're not, should actually be fun. You should actually be able to associate the test with a good time. You should be looking forward to it. And and have you don't have to be a competitive person, but have that kind of feeling of, you know, this is something that I can be triumphant in and, and go with that spirit of seeing what you can do. Um, does that make sense? I mean, I'm not answering it from the perspective of memory, but that, that would be the... That no, would no, be the, it's, it's great. I, I was just thinking of... Um, Oh, what's his name? Um, the language uh, tutor guy, um, Michel Thomas. Yeah. In every single one of his programs, he says, "Don't try to remember." Right, right. It, 
is that do you agree with that? Is that a, a good vision to have or I like listening to Michel Thomas. He's really interesting, but I think that's misguided to not try to remember <laughs> or better better said to put memory out of the game is misguided. But to sit and listen to his program, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I often do this myself, is just listen to a program and not even try to remember. There's a really cool one called Notes in Spanish where they talk about what they're going to talk about, then they speak for about 10 minutes of dialogue or even five minutes of dialogue with each other, and then they go through what they said. And they don't say anything like Michel Thomas, you know, don't try to memorize anything. But they give you that opportunity to actually recognize what they've discussed in the context of a discussion, and then they discuss uh, right. again. And that's like a really cool sort of thing where you don't want to be meddling around with memory techniques. You want to immerse yourself in that experience. But then what you do if you're following notes in Spanish is if you want to use a memory method, then you go and memorize all that stuff, and then you go listen to it again. And uh, you get that kind of confirmation of what you've done. And so, yeah, but Michel Thomas has some kind of quirky things like... There's that little bell that rings as if you're going to get Pavlovian conditioning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the next time you hear a bell, you're going to be like, oh, that was that was this phrase or whatever. Yeah, so. it's, it's funny. No, I always thought that phrase was a little bit gimmicky in itself, like don't try to remember because I could understand if, if when we are lost for a word, we couldn't retrieve it. Then it would make sense to say don't try to remember because you're not going to get it anyway. But I often find myself taking a pause of maybe five, ten seconds, and then I find the word in sort of mid mid memory. I don't know the technical term, but not long term, yeah. not uh, short term, but somewhere in between. Well, that point of relaxation just came up the other day. I interviewed on the on my podcast um, Mark Shannon, and he's a grand member, grand master of memory, like Ed Cook, and uh, he was talking about how when he competed it was really all it came down to was knowing the techniques and being relaxed so right. that you can you can actually get out of your own way and let memory do what it do its job and and also not fearing that two or three seconds you need sometimes to recall something because right. when you push and when you force then nothing's nothing wants to come it wants to get out of your ego's way and uh, when you're you know bruce lee said a quote that i love very much in enter the dragon he said no self no enemy and we, we often use our ego to make enemies out of things that aren't enemies. So when you can get out of your own way, often what you need to recall will come. Yeah, relax. But I guess the problem with language learning is often when you're recalling memory, and it's in a very tense situation where people are awaiting your response in a, in a communication scenario, for instance. So that might be the problem where it's like if you stall for too long that the conversation is kind of ruined and you always want to make conversation nice. So I guess that's the problem. Yeah, well, I think that language learners have that and they they feel like they've made a mistake. They've taken a left turn when they meant to take a right turn and then they give up. But even in our mother tongue conversations, we have these moments where we're like, what was I trying to say? Give me a second, it'll come back to me. <laughs> or let's talk about something else or whatever. So it's not always a problem of lacking in fluency or not knowing enough of the language, there's also the mix of just how that we are in our own mother tongue in terms of absent-mindedness, not paying attention, missing a word, parapraxies, like all kinds of weird things can happen that have nothing to do with the language in and of itself or the language as such. And I think language learners get caught up in that when they're speaking and they think that it has to do with the language when it's just other human things going on. Right. Yeah, yeah, I guess in general, just relax. <laughs> yeah. the, that's the point. I love this term that I heard when I was teaching in the United States, which is chillax. Chillax, is, yeah. <laughs> which I, I love guess that. Can, It's one of the few good it. Americanisms, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, well, let's talk about your book for a while, because you have a few books out, let's be honest. Uh, yeah. what's, um, what's the special about this one, apart from you calling it the ultimate language learning secret? Well, I think there's a lot of things that make it special, the one being that it truly is the ultimate language learning secret <laughs> in, a, in a Yoda sense, you know, because I'll be quite forward with people, it never says at all what the ultimate language learning secret is. But if you read the book and you do the things that it says, then you'll know exactly what the ultimate language learning secret is. 
So, yeah, I mean, I purposely structured it that way to create some interest and, and uh, mystery and a bit of adventure for the reader. But anybody can write down the ultimate language learning secret on an index card. But if you did that, no one would pay attention to it. Right. And no one would be no one would be interested in actually investigating and living and experiencing it. But I think all of us who have spent any time learning language can probably put it down into one word what the ultimate language learning secret is. So that's uh, that's not going to be a whole book though. <laughs> and I really wanted to really elaborate on what all that is and parse it out, give stories, give examples and kind of make people think about what that ultimate language learning secret is so that they can arrive at it through the process of exploring the different ideas to what language learning can be. Right. And it, who would you say it's sort of directed to? Would it be any, Can anyone benefit from it, or is it better for people who are sort of newer to learning languages? I think anybody can benefit from it because it's about learning as well and we're always learning a language. If you wanted to get better in your mother tongue it will be a useful book to read and hopefully an inspiring one and and just something that gets you thinking about what learning a language or even living a language is all about. So it's all around. Yeah, it's it's really just about language learning and learning in general. So, I mean, I study my own mother tongue all the time, and the, it, it's the same process that I would go through, the same sort of ideas, the same principles of learning, and to make it exciting. Because there are some, let's face it, there's some boring things that go on in right. the world of language learning, and you really want to motivate yourself and stimulate yourself, and it's all mindset. It's like relaxation. Can you get out of the way of your own ego and really identify what your goals are, really feel those goals in your body, be really sure that those really, really are your goals, because a lot of people have the wrong reasons for why they're pursuing certain things, mm -hmm. and you know, get in line with what you're actually trying to achieve, because you really do want to achieve it, and that's, that's more than one word on an index card to <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> explain how you can do all that stuff. Yeah, it's a good sell, and, and I, was, I just noticed you, you made an even better deal than you originally planned to. You, well, you, you know, <laughs> I'm a man of many surprises. <laughs> yeah, so uh, if people are interested in picking up the ultimate language learning secret, you know, you can actually get it for 99 cents right now for the next 45 minutes, it seems like, from my Amazon anyway. That could be. Um, <laughs> it's, well, anyway, it's go, uh, <laughs> go to Amazon uh, and, and pick up the book, uh, obviously. We have a two questions and the first is from Kirsten Anthony I'm curious about how you go about your memory skills in everyday life do you memorize every day your shopping list packing list order of songs on the radio well yeah that's an interesting question because I do memorize every day but the last thing on earth I'm gonna memorize is my shopping list and I, and and it's 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 something that really frustrates me because all over the internet there are lessons in how to, how to memorize stuff and they almost always use the example of a shopping list. And I, my rule of thumb is if I can write it down on a piece of paper, <laughs> then why would, why would I use precious memory space to memorize a shopping list? Now, that doesn't mean to discourage anybody from doing that because it can be a good exercise if you're interested in shopping lists. But the, the point is, is that when you're doing something as exciting and potentially profitable as as exercising your memory, and I don't just mean in a monetary sense, but profitable in terms of life improvement, you want to actually exercise your memory with something you're interested in, something you're passionate about, something that's going to make a difference in your life. So that could be memorizing the lyrics of a song, uh, which can be tremendously edifying and useful in many ways. So, but my daily memory exercise varies. It's usually some vocabulary, some phrases, in whatever I may be studying, it's often I memorize a deck of cards not for having a deck of cards memorized as such, although it comes in handy for magic tricks, but to to warm up. It's a great warm up exercise, and it, it really gets you loose and limber and ready to go to other stuff. But I'm always working on memory every day, also as an instructor. So I run different experience uh, experiments and 
pushing the limits and seeing what's possible and speaking with coaching clients and you know seeing what they're up to and just interviewing other memory experts and hearing their ideas and uh, it's just that's all I do is just memory every day but in terms of practical application I have to be honest and say if I'm gonna go to the grocery store I'm probably I probably already know what I want to buy anyway but in the rare case that there's some special ingredients I'm not gonna waste my memory power on a list of ingredients because I'd rather be spending that time and that mental space and memory palaces and such on maybe ten new words or or some poetry or something like that right I know that sounds totally ridiculous but I just don't I can't see any serious nemonist you know really going mm, 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 stretching a little bit to remember mustard <laughs> you know it's just <laughs> so that's no. my first rule of thumb if I can write it down and I don't need it in my head save my head for something that I do need or do want that will make a real improvement in my life yeah do you think that's in any way connected to students uh, in elementary school failing to learn secondary languages because they are not very interested and so they say the memory is not important and then choose not to remember it? Yeah, well, there is a certain... Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if you can choose not to remember things. No, but um, I'm just meaning if you if you go into German class at age 12 or something and you say, oh, German is the worst crap in the world. I don't want to learn it. Is it then automatically down-prioritized in your, in your memory, similarly to the shopping list, because you're like, oh, I don't need to remember it, so why should I? Yeah, that that could be. Um, I really think that it's a bit of a shame that people are put into language classes uh, by default, and certainly that's the case in Canada. And you can you can see the results of that very very easily if you actually talk to Canadians. And how many of English Canadians actually know French is incredibly small, and right. a lot of it has to do with being put into French language classes by default and they're put into them too late and mm -hmm. not every school is an immersion school which it should be and so it's it, it, it's kind of a, a phenomenon where they they make it un, unpleasant to to learn it and they make it not part of every day so right. it's not fun. Yeah because yeah, and I think it's a problem as well and I, I mean, for, for Denmark, you know, we, we kind of get English automatically, immersion from television, video games, whatever, um, just culture, I guess. Uh, but German, the I guess it's the third language, but we usually get that around grades five or six. And most students hate it, absolutely hate it. And I think that's part of the way it's being taught as well. It's very classroom style, you know. So students are just not learning that way naturally. Um, but I think definitely there's something to be improved on there. I'd love to do like a language revolution, kind of revolutionize the elementary school language learning. And like you say, give the students a choice. Or maybe just an illusion of choice could help. Like, do you want to study French or German? You know, <laughs> and then they at least have a, have a say in it. Um, yeah, well, there's a, there's a wonderful hypnotic exercise where you can say, but of course it's up to you to choose whether you want to learn French or German. And that already reduces resistance, right? Yeah. Because you're giving them the choice or the illusion of choice. But there's something interesting that they're doing in Berlin. I don't know if it's all over Germany, but kitas, which are like neighborhood kindergartens, they have trilingual kitas. Oh, so really? the the child can learn, learn uh, French... Russian and say Spanish or have that around them in an immersive environment from very young age um, which is really exciting and I know a couple people who have deliberately chosen these trilingual kitas so that's that's really the way to do it I think or it's one way that's a lot more profound and impacting than waiting until you're in grade five when you're almost nine or ten which is the threshold for even mastering an accent so right and that's when you get sort of the teenage uh, mood swings let's put it this way <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so focus might be lower than when you're slightly younger that's that's and that's when you want to start learning lyrics and memorizing <laughs> lyrics so you can you know sing to your coming uh, partners in uh, the romantic yeah, the girls let's just say it you know <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. So it's supposed to be. Anyway, we had another question from uh, Yvonne Ray, and she asks, "What's the best way to improve one's memory when it comes to language learning?" And I suppose this is sort of what why you wrote the book to answer this question. But if you could give sort of a a few actionable uh, tips, we can do. Okay. Well, the action really, at least from my perspective and the results I've been able to help people get and that I get for myself, is a little bit involved to explain, but I'm happy to go through it in brief strokes, The basically what it work, how it works. And the first thing is, is to really know where you are in the language learning process and see, have a good picture in your mind of what you want to achieve. So with all that said, let's say you've got that figured out, you'd build memory palaces that respond to where you need to go. And I'm really, really focused on memory palaces. There's other things you can do. There's other things that people do. But the memory palace is the fundamental structure. And it's very, very good for very simple grammar principles, but mostly for vocabulary and even complex grammar principles when you're at a stage where you can actually understand them and understand them through use. And so vocabulary is really the main focus and vocabulary building. And basically, a memory palace is best created by understanding some simple principles, like having a linear journey inside of your memory palace, not crossing your own path, making sure that you're actually moving outward instead of inward so you're not trapping yourself anywhere. And you want the memory palace to reduce cognitive load to an absolute minimum so that you're actually focusing on the words that you're going to place there. Because a lot of people, ha they fail to have success with memory palaces in general, and especially for language learning, because they haven't constructed the memory palaces with enough precision. And when I say this, I'm not talking about 40-year project. I'm talking about something that takes four minutes if you know the principles, but you've got to keep them in mind in order to make a really successful memory palace. And then, let's just say you got a list of 10 words. What I, what I do and get people to do, and this is what really makes things fast and can really build your vocabulary quickly, is you pick words that all start with the same letter mm. and the same letter parts. And some people tell me this is absolutely insane. This is... <laughs> this is a, 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 a this is an exercise in chaos, but it really isn't, because so long as you have identified where you are in your language learning goals, you know what kind of words that you need. You're gonna say ten ten words in a ten station memory palace, and the station means bed, chair, or even an entire room, kitchen, bathroom, and then you're gonna put those words in alphabetical order along that journey, and you're gonna create images that help you move from station to station and decode those words piece by piece. So if you had a list of words in Spanish that start with AB, you could use Abraham Lincoln to walk from station to station and to do interesting things huh. that, that help you recall those words. And then the real magic happens is when you use these images in such a way that they help you recall the sound and the meaning of the word in the same stroke. Right, and so then you just rehearse that in your mind, and this be this turns your brain into space repetition software, because <laughs> you don't you don't need index cards and you don't need a machine. You just wan wander along with Abraham Lincoln a sufficient number of times, or whoever the character may be, Einstein for E I N German words, or your friend Vera for V E R words and whatever. Mm -hmm. And by the way, this all applies to non-Latinate alphabet languages. It's just you just rig it differently, but it's basically the same principle. And I'm working now in Japanese, and it's it's golden. You just need to do homophonic transliterations, or <laughs> or apply directly to the actual uh, character sets. And full kanji works really nicely. But the best way to do that, I have found, is to memorize uh, all the radicals first. And so you could have four memory palaces with 50 stations. Pop those radicals over, say, a month or so into long-term memory, and then you can do full full kanji relatively simply, which I say that with a grain of salt. But <laughs> nonetheless, this is a method of, of getting traction really, really fast. You just got to do it strategically, and it all starts with that foundation of the memory pals working properly. So I don't know if that's throwing too much at you, but that's basically all of it in a nutshell. 
No, it's it's great. Uh, the only thing I, I have to ask you about the memory palace is I'm, I'm very fascinated by it, but I'm also hopelessly uh, uncreative or I just don't have an imagination. And I'm sure you hear this all the time, mm -hmm. but I just can't imagine, let's say, uh, I mean, they say to have a decent conversation in language, you need, what, 5,000, four or 5,000 roots, right? How How can you... I just don't see the logistics. Can you just uh, address where, where do you put all these words? I mean, is your memory palace uh, like a huge uh, castle? or No, the memory palace... Well, it's not memory palace. It's memory palaces. Uh, right. Because the, there's a lot of people who build mega singular memory palaces. Just one memory palace to, to bind them all or whatever. You know, <laughs> And it's just... I understand that, but I don't do it that way. I when I when I want to go work on a language, I build as many memory palaces as there are letters in the alphabet. The exception being character sets like kanji or whatever. Um, <laughs> but even then, I would still have a 26 or 27 letter alphabet to correspond to romanji, let's say, or whatever homophonic transliteration stuff that can be done to get traction going in the language. And so 26, 27, 28, 31, whatever language we're dealing with, this is not an extraordinary amount of memory palaces. If you think about all the homes you've lived in, all the schools you've gone to, all the restaurants you've eaten in, all the hotel rooms that you've been to, all the libraries that you like, all the movie theaters in your town, the museums, the churches, hospitals, doctor's offices, dentist's offices, you've got more real estate in your head than you need in order to get a real solid foundation going for a system of memory palaces. And this requires zero imagination. It only requires a bit of self-reflection. You can use your car, you know, you can use the driveway in front of your house. There's all kinds of places that everybody has. And even if you live in the countryside, there are solutions to finding multiple places that you can cordon off as memory palaces and then you just split them up into stations and then you start loading words there. And I can guarantee beyond a doubt that anybody who gets started with this and they actually give it a the good old college try, they're going to at least see the exponential value of doing this or the exponential possibilities that lie for someone who, who that stand ahead of the journey for someone who decides to get their backpack on and start walking because it's endless what you can do. Right. And and the thing is, I know it works. I mean, I've seen it on on a few TV shows where they got someone. Uh, you know, the horse racing is very popular in England, and they have that huge um, Grand National every year. There's 40 horses in it, and they all have different colored uh, gear on, so you can identify them. So the this presenter got the task of memorizing all the names of the horses, basically in a day. And the memory expert they send in. They basically took a tour around the hotel they were staying in, and his his memory rate just it was just crazy. I mean, first he couldn't remember any of them; he was just guessing basically. And then after just one tour around, he was getting something like an 80, 85 percent correct rate on you know forty different colored horses. <laughs> well, I'm glad you mentioned that number because that is the number uh, that is the typical number in scientific studies with mnemonics and language learning. That's the rate of recall that most language learners will get, as opposed to 40 to, at the most, 60% recall with rote learning. So there's science to this, and it's been studied. The only real barrier is, do you like it or do you not? Right. And can I encourage you and be the cheerleader that helps you like it? That's all, that's, those are the only two questions. Yeah, do you like it or do you not? And can you be made to like it? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I'd love to try that, it out. People do it with video games as well. It's like the Grand Theft Auto series. There's some guy on Memorize who did a complete memory palace on, on the Vice City map because people who've played that game will know that inside out, basically. You know, you yeah. drive around that stupid island so much and by the time you can basically draw it, a perfect recall in your hand almost. <laughs> I found that very yeah. cool. You can use video games as well and... I mean, but the the thing is always reducing cognitive load. So when you use imaginary memory palaces, you have to rebuild it in mm -hmm. a way that's quite more labor intensive than your home. 
but that's no reason not to do it. Um, it's just something. It's a consideration. Because you were not actually there. It's an extra layer of imagination. Well, it's not so much that you're not there. It's that you've never been there. And but there are some studies I've read that that the brain is showing signs that it is almost as if you've been there in terms <laughs> of. And there, there, there's a, a study, I could send it to anybody who's interested, but there's a very, very interesting study that came out not so long ago where they were talking about the speed at which you can build memory palaces and they were actually using video game-like software to test the difference between a memory palace based on your own home and a memory palace based on interactions with this software world. And uh, there's interesting results in terms of the difference, but the use of those memory palaces for language learning has not been studied and my prediction would be that you're better off with a place that you've actually been. A physical place. Yeah. Yeah. Smell the smells almost. Um, we got a few other questions coming in. Um, have you heard of Harry Lorraine? I read yeah. his book when I was a kid and he still seems to be writing books. This is from Oliver Antosh. Yeah, his last book is Ageless Memory, and I have an interview with him that uh, I was honored to be able to speak with him. So if anybody's interested in that, there is a way to get it at magneticmemorymethod.com. And yeah, so Harry Lorraine is awesome. He's been a huge influence on me, but he's in many ways he's also the beginning of why I started doing this because in the memory book, there's two pages on memorizing vocabulary and. Uh, I thought, hmm, this is not much of a much of a starting point, and so I figured out everything basically on my own using the universal ancient principles of memory, and uh, I turned those two pages into thousands of pages, and I've literally written thousands of pages since then in all my newsletters. Right. All right. Cool. So uh, Oliver, go uh, listen to that. That will be interesting for you. And uh, we got Ollie Richards. Um, what aspects of memorizing do you still struggle with, even as an expert? Oh, well, lots of them. Uh, I struggle with the same thing that anybody else struggles, which is getting, getting down to doing it and doing it in a structured manner and actually going through the effort of setting myself up. So it, it, like a runner metaphor would be good. The runner, in order to get on the track, it's not just about going and running. You got to get the right shoes. You got to tie up your shoelaces. You got to get the, not only the clothes that you're going to wear for the running, but also the towel that you're going to use to wash yourself or dry yourself after you take the shower. And maybe you need a starter pistol. And I don't know. Like you just <laughs> there's there's stuff that needs to be done in order for this to work. And so that's really what the ultimate language learning secret is all about is like how do you get yourself to do all that stuff that you need to do before you get to the racing track and I wouldn't say that I struggle with it so much but it's still a struggle and I, I mean I think if you even listen to Tony Robbins he would say that every morning he still has to you know go through a certain amount of processes in order to eat that salad and uh, hype himself up to go and do his Tony Robbins thing and so it's just a human uh, reality that we want to be lazy or we want to fall back on the the what would you say the the lowest common denominator of energy expenditure which again gets back to the ego and the ego always wants to maintain this certain status quo so bed is comfortable stay right. in bed <laughs> sort of thing but uh, for me it's 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 that's that's a struggle that I don't think is ever going to disappear. Another thing is, is the actual kind of wish that recall would just happen instantly without having to go back and sometimes fiddle with things. Like you want to get, you want to create this crazy picture, and you just want it to work 100% of the time, all the time, and to have perfect recall from the get-go. But you do have to go back and fix things sometimes. And sometimes it's just not quite right. So, you know, that is sometimes a frustration more than a struggle uh, because there's always the fantasy that this is a magic bullet and it's going to work all the time, but uh, it doesn't. And but that's also that's that's also the beauty of it is because you go back, you learn more about how memory works, you get a bit faster, you get a bit stronger, and 
this is the real kicker for language learning, is that you're always, always, always paying attention to the language that you're learning as you're paying attention to the memory skills. So you get the best of both worlds. But it's still, it, it, it's effort. It's, I think it's effort in the sense that eating chocolate takes effort. Uh, but it's still, <laughs> there's, still en there's still energy right. being exchanged. And there's, you get nothing if you're not spending time, energy, or money. And in this case, it's definitely time and energy. And uh, yeah, it's an expenditure. But it's a beautiful expenditure. It's a, a it, it's a pure expenditure, and the payoff is incredible. Yeah, it's a, like the universal secret, if I might might call it so. It's just like if you want something, <laughs> to work towards it. You can't just wish. <laughs> That's the thing. I think that I think really uh, to answer all the a little bit further is the ultimate challenge. I think, and the ultimate thing that I struggle with, even with the expertise and all this is always linking it to that effort creating more energy than it takes. And so that's that's the ultimate, that's, that's the uh, perpetual motion machine, is how do you get things rigged up so that you are creating more energy than you're spending. And right. when you can do that, then it's just, it's a fantastic feeling. It's basically joggers high. And but you still got to go to sleep at some point. And you still got to get back up in the morning and put the shoes back on. So that's uh, that's just that's just reality. I mean, the the Greeks had a word for that. I think it is pharmakon. The ancient Greeks, that is. And it's, the, the cure is the poison. The poison is the cure. Right. They always sort of go together. Yeah, it's a beautiful sort of connection with everything, really. I mean, from dieting to language learning to success in business it's all it's all interconnected i feel yeah well, uh, that's, oh sorry go ahead that that's a, that's another really important thing to realize is that language learning is not some special isolated activity it's it is like dieting or it is like business and, and it really comes down to identifying why you're doing what you're doing and exactly what you need to be doing as you're doing it so that you're working in a focused, targeted way so that you're not playing Xeno games where the arrow is never going to reach the target, but that you actually can get that arrow to the target so that you can go and pluck the arrow out of the target and see, ah, there's another target beyond this target and you know start firing the arrows at the next place. Whatever. I mean, we can go through all the metaphors in the world, but this is... <laughs> This is really what life is all about, and so language learning is not some special section of, of life. It belongs to all kinds of other things that we do and that we can do successfully. Right. And there was uh, something that I I think it was Ed Koch who said. Uh, he was talking about the record times for memorizing a deck of cards and how that in 100 years that like the improvement is so incredible. Uh, it was like over a minute a uh, hundred years ago or something, and now it's like 18 seconds or something. Yeah, it's, it's it's gotten so fast that they're building a a machine essentially that's going well, not a machine, but some kind of digital device that's going to flash the cards in front of the competitors' eyes because they can't test they can't test it any further because the speed of the human hand to flip the cards is limited. Oh. So oh, yeah, that's needed. true. That's so yeah. true. Of course it's going to take more than a second or two to flip a card from... I mean, I can show you. The the fastest the human hand is going to get is like that, right? Right. Just And people can start... That That's as fast as you can get, is what your hand can do. So they're, they're, they're working on, on, a, on a device that will speed it up. But do you think do you think that's a because we discovered techniques to to improve our memorization, or do you think it's because we're just constantly evolving in a sense that we're not? I mean, we're nowhere near perfection in terms of memory. Do you think we're getting? I mean, I guess the question is, do you think we'll peak, or do you think we'll just keep improving memory? I don't know. I mean, in a competitive sense. There may never be a peak. There may always be a way to shave off a nanosecond. But that's a particular kind of memory. That's competitive memory. And in terms of what I'm interested in and really curious about testing over the years of my life and with the people that are interested in, in taking this project of mine on for themselves is 
you know, there's a metaphor of the brain being like a sponge, and it gets so saturated that it has to squeeze information out in order to have new information come in. But the thing with the memory palace or the memory palace way of doing things is you can always go to another building, right? And I don't think that that means you have to forget your childhood home when you go into a new building when you're 98, right? right. And so because of that ability to maintain both the first building you remember and the one you were just in five minutes ago, you should be able to have each of those contain memorized vocabulary, let's say. And so you could really push the limits, but it, 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 again, it, well, I don't know if I... It, you have to actually use that stuff in order to, to have it be, quote-unquote, in your memory, right? Mm. So, and that has to happen in the present moment, but those are the real thresholds I'm interested in, and will they put a cap on memorizing cards? I mean, that, does that make a difference at the end of the day for competitors? Absolutely, and I think it's fascinating. But to what extent that I can apply that to language learning, I don't know because in, in my, my feeling with language learning is that the question isn't how fast can you do it, it's how reliantly can you do it mm -hmm. so that there's a long-term impact for your speaking, reading, writing, and listening practice and that that can, that can snowball mm -hmm. and, and uh, create compound interest, so to speak, in terms of getting real results that make a huge difference in your life. So if I can transfer that stuff from memory championships and competition into language learning, that's fantastic. But in terms of the, ca the cap, I don't think there is a cap on what you can do with memory palaces in terms of how many you can have and what you can put in them. It's just maintenance. And that's what <laughs> buildings are all about. <laughs> buildings need janitors. Yeah. <laughs> that's fantastic. I, I, I have been thinking about uh, the quality of our memories uh, for a long time because, you know, if you're doing something like Memorize or Anki, the temptation will always be there to see how fast can you go through your cards. But just because you go through a thousand cards in two hours doesn't mean that the long-term effect is the same as if you'd taken four hours or just, you know, taking it easy like we talked about earlier. So what's your opinion on, on speed and, and language learning? When, when are we sabotaging ourselves and, and where could we actually speed up a little bit, if, if anywhere? Well, you can certainly sabotage yourself by, using, by spending a lot of time on, on words that you're never going to use unless you're into philology and things of that nature and you want to be reading high order stuff like philosophy or biology or scientific things in a language where there's specialized terminology but where you can really speed up is the distance of time between let's say memorizing learning and memorizing and actually putting things into use so you could for example if you're meeting a tandem partner you could do your memorization se session for specific words because you know you're going to talk about the topic of your city or you, where you were born and you could memorize a bunch of keywords bef shortly before that you meet that person and speed up that process of using the words by having them show up after you've uh, tested your recall and then start using them immediately and even before your tutor shows up start writing sentences with those words and so forth that you're going to then use in your discussion. 